Thank you for downloading and listening to the 4 Million Years Later podcast, a show where two friends watch an episode of the Gen 1 Transformers series in order and then get together to talk about what they saw. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... And I'm Hoover. Join us now. As we begin the second episode of... 4 Million Years Later. Season 1 Wrap-Up. So here's an interesting topic, at least I thought it was interesting. If you could change anything about season one of Transformers, what would mm. you change? Now, keep in mind, I'm saying like realistically change. Don't say, well, I'd put Thundercracker in half of every episode like I would. But, uh... <laughs> all Thundercracker, all the time. It'd be the Thundercracker show starring the Transformers. <laughs> Yeah, just something realistically that you think would be feasible for them to have done differently. This is actually, I think it's a tough question because you're asking both of us to step back and somewhat objectively assess the cartoon. And I'm not confident that I have a lot of ability to do that because a lot of my assessment is based on how I engaged with it as a child, I think. I like to think that I did some stepping back and looking at it like as a work of fiction or as an entertainment in and of itself, you know, really talking about how, well, Jesus, it's awful serious. But like, even when I make that critique of saying like, oh, this is a very serious or very, I wouldn't say grim. I wouldn't call it grim, but it is, it's not silly in any places and mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't feel like it's like, I think something we talked about just a little while ago is like, it's not trying to sort of step down to meet the kids. It's sort of asking the kids to step up and meet them halfway. Even when I make that assessment, I can't say that that's a real critique because that's exactly what I think was attracting me to it as a fourth grader, mm. right? So my reflex is to go like, oh, I would definitely pump up the joy and, and make it more silly in places. I'm not sure that, that I, I would actually advocate that. But I, I guess if I were to change anything... I would fix a lot of the dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny that in saying that, because like I've always attributed Sunbow as being one of the biggest influences on me, my writing as a uh, cartoonist who makes comic books for young people in that Sunbow was the first time I noticed that, oh, they all speak differently. And I'm not talking about jazz rhyming in later seasons or gung ho, always talking about gumbo in GI Joe or something like that. I'm talking about like, they have specific turns of phrases and they say, each character says, let's go over there in a way that tells you something about their worldview. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're not always super successful at it in season one. You know, well, I'll be a Cybertronic bolt bat. What? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Sides of what you deal with the folksy animal puns or <laughs> event puns, but like expressions, you know. But I would dial that up more. I would be hinting at more personality through the dialogue. There are episodes that I think do it exceedingly well. Fire in the Sky is an almost perfect episode for that. So that'd be one. And the other one that I would do is, uh, you know how... I think we've been remarking on this a lot too. Later iterations of the Transformers, not all of them, but a lot of them tend to focus on smaller casts, mm -hmm. you know, like at least like the more memorable ones or the ones that we remember because we watched them. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Beast Wars, Transformers Prime, Transformers Animated. We're mostly following a small group of people. Mm -hmm. But what the parts of season one that I really enjoy are when they focus on different little crack teams. And yes, have Optimus and Megatron and Starscream be main characters in this thing. But let's have an adventure where, yeah, we're going to see Prime. He's going he's to talk to whoever we're following, but we're going to follow these four, mm -hmm. right? Let's literally like take the toys, put them in a bag, shake it up, pull out four guys, make a story around that, right? Yeah. I would enjoy if they did more of that. If I was writing my own Transformers comic series that nobody would buy, by the way, because they would be like, oh, it's going to remind me of my childhood. And then they're going to read it and like, oh, it's just like the old cartoon. That's not what I want. Mm -hmm. But but that's the way I would probably approach it is like a lost season of the Transformers where I would just literally just grab like random groups of, of people to go on mini adventures together. Hmm. What about you? What would you change? Well, I was embracing the question and probably a much more practical thing is I specifically would have changed the introduction of Devastator. Oh. I mean, this was an exciting new toy 
I mean, not, not just exciting like any other new Transformers. I mean, this was the first combining Transformer. And you watch that episode, and it's just like, oh, yeah, by the way, we also combine. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It's it's a cool scene. It's, it's animated pretty okay. But, yeah, it's not... Because even when the Stunticons show up later, Megatron actually makes like a big production mm-hmm. out of it, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas this, it's like it happens before Megatron even gets there. Yeah. So it's like, oh, you spoiled the surprise, Scrapper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's only so much you could change, but I would make Heavy Metal War into two episodes. I mean, granted, we probably wouldn't have much influence over the amount of episodes in the season, but I would mm-hmm. say, you know, make it a two-parter or just wait until the next season because you really can't do this justice by cramming all that stuff into one episode. You could still have an episode about the Prime Megatron battle, which really the Constructicons didn't factor into at all other than sneaking off to the Ark. So And building the exchange furnace, yeah. Yeah, you could get that stuff done some other way or just introduce the construct cons in the prior episode and then have them do all that construct con stuff in heavy metal war but devastator just deserved a much better surprising jaw-dropping showcase and they were just like yeah we're construct cons we're here now you know it's like oh by the way we transformed phase two and now we're a big robot and you didn't even get like autobot reaction no, it's like no, it's because Spike is the only one who says, yeah. Prime, what is that thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like this is a vehicle literally to sell toys. Yeah. And it's like, how do you mess up selling Devastator to me? You know, it's like <laughs> this. This is the thing that all the effort should be a, have been put into. This is the most expensive if you count Devastator as one toy. And mm. I got the gift set as a kid, so technically it was kind of one toy for me to get. That should have been so much more important, and because of its importance, taken so much longer to craft, and it just seems like it was just sort of injected in, like, oh, by the way, we got this new guy here. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it, it should be like a huge crescendo of an episode that just, like, makes every kid amazed at the fact that a six transformers can combine into one transformer and it's it's got to make him want to like run out of the house right then and go get him but it just falls flat like i said i don't want to really place any blame on donald glut specifically because it feels like some editors like came in here and came in with a heavy hand and dumbed things down and everything so yeah, i we, don't we made, i'm not pointing the finger at him at all Sure, but I suspect what you're picking up on too is there are certain episodes where there doesn't feel like there's much emotional storytelling happening, right? Mm-hmm. It's to again quote Ron Friedman, it's this whole like parading the characters across the screen. And yeah. that whole episode is really about Prime being extremely gullible, Megatron sort of showcasing each of the Decepticons that you should buy, right? You know, by just doing like using their powers. And then, yeah, and then it's like the Dinobots versus Devastator, and it's just like, look at all of these different amazing toys you can have. Whereas when you look at, again, like episodes like Fire in the Mountain, Fire in the Sky, where there's like some like emotions happening in the story. So like it feels like it matters. So it's not just that, oh, look at look at Skyfire. He's so big. He's so mm-hmm. big. He's so big that he changes size sometimes. <laughs> like he's <laughs> he's like the size of a Mega Supreme, and sometimes he's like just like a head taller than Megatron. But either way, it's like it's cool new, it's an Autobot jet. But what makes you remember it is the fact that this character had to deal with some difficult decisions and emotions in the story. I don't, I don't, even, mm-hmm. I don't even want to say character growth because I don't think that's necessary. I think just watching the character grapple with something hard is enough to make. Because I think of like in season three, there's an episode called Chaos, which is a very memorable episode. And it's about, you know, a, a seasoned, developed Transformer reflecting on a past event where they failed yeah. and they really failed hard. And then they, they so badly that they refused to even talk about it. You know, it's like that episode stands out, you know? So like this one, while it feels like it's a memorable episode, cause we watch the tapes a lot. It, I was surprised at how little I remembered like for like note for note in this episode or that episode rather, just because like, there's not much to like hang our feelings on. And, mm-hmm. and so like when devastator combines, it's like, as a kid, I was like, Whoa, that's cool. The story I always tell is the first time I saw Robotech and I was so excited 
that I got up and I jumped up and down on the couch and I was like screaming like, yeah, because it was so good. And I got a Charlie horse for the first time in my life. I know I've told you this before. I must have. Yeah. And I fell yeah. on the floor because I didn't know what happened. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I killed my leg because it didn't feel like I broke anything, but like something happened. I can't move it and it hurts really bad. And I remember calling my mom at work being like, mom, I did something terrible to my leg. <laughs> what were you doing? I was watching a cartoon. <laughs> And like the devastator moment doesn't really give you that because it's just no not eh. at all yeah so yeah i think that's fair he deserved better he deserved better so my critiques and changes were more broadly speaking yours you had a very mm-hmm. specific instance <laughs> right yeah so that said can you think of anything specific now that i've said mine that brings to mind something that you would do along those lines um would I do something specific with a specific episode? Well, I mean, I would probably put in more of um, the, the human's friendship with the Autobots. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I keep coming back to that, and I'm like, I don't. Would I like that as a child, boy? But as an adult, I would love to have Chip in more episodes, and and actually have him like have more of a presence at Autobot headquarters, even if it's just to have like one line to go, like, "Oh, Chip, you're so square." <laughs> But like as far as like the construction of the episodes, uh, I'm thinking back because like I celebrate the ones that I think are really great, and then the ones that aren't so great, I'm just like, eh. And I shrug right. my shoulders, and I I guess I just like I, I accept the fact there's going to be like not so awesome ones in there. But what's one do you, do you remember me like being like eh about? No, oh, I I think I found something to like in just about every one of them. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean I mean there definitely was something to like in every one. Yeah. We shall see if season two still yeah. has that level yeah. for us. So we saw in Countdown to Extinction at the very beginning where the Decepticons were see what they were seeing what they do, A, when they're not fighting Autobots, and B, when Megatron's not around, I would do more of that mm-hmm. too. Oh yeah. I would definitely eat up more of that for sure. And I would love like one of the things that I really, really like in my kids' fiction is when we f- when we see that uh the quote unquote bad guys don't just gnash their teeth evilly all the time, that they have friends and they have people they care about too. One of the things that, and I talked about this in one of my micro essays leading up to the show, is that one thing that I think Transformers has as an advantage over other cartoon series up until Transformers Prime, and then they bring out the Viacons and I'm like, oh, well, you kind of dash that, is the army building characters, i.e. the Seekers, are all individuals. And mm. there's something that makes it more compassionate as a war story when you have individuals on both sides instead of G.I. Joe versus Cobra, right? Oh, mm. it's it's an army of guys with masks over their faces. We don't even know who they are, right? And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Duke can just like, you know, blow up a, a Jeep, it flips over and they all run away, you know? Mm-hmm. Whereas when the Decepticons are battling and Skywarp gets hit and then he bumps into Thundercracker, they both crash. It's like, well, you, you just lost two of your, of your bros, Starscream. You know, yeah. And when Thrusturge and Ramjet show up later, it's like they're three individuals. So I would lean into that aspect more, and I would definitely try to fit in. Like I would have a mandate saying, like, can't always when writing an episode, can you fit in 120 seconds? That's that's all I'm asking of just showing that a Decepticon cares about something other than blowing up Autobots. Mm, I'm definitely for that. Because <laughs> like I also find the teeth gnashing villain supremely boring right like the seething villain where all they think about just as like we made fun of Optimus for like I always think about this Decepticon spike okay well don't give me a villain who only thinks about conquering the world or defeating their enemies or hurting people show me a villain who also plays Monopoly you know <laughs> I mean or something right just something mm-hmm. else that shows me that they're, that they're a person a good example would be Skybite oh my gosh yes yes and Skybite one of my very, very favorite Transformers of all time. Even Tarantulas. Tarantulas in Beast Wars is, like, we mm. see that he has other things to do. Yeah. <laughs> he has other pursuits, you know? So, stuff like that. I mean, and, and don't get me wrong. I love characters like Scorponok in Beast Wars or Lugnut in Transformers Animated who are just, like, they got one note. I love Megatron, you know? <laughs> that That's fun, too. But, like, mm-hmm. give me other things. And show me how they interact when the boss isn't at home. Right. So yes, like I would basically I'd take one thing and I'd say like let's replicate that as much as we can. Mm. So I guess that's all I got. Oh, I agree. That sounds good. So I have been sitting on this for a while. Once we conceptualized this podcast, I remembered the story, but I thought, well, I have to 
sit on this one so I can reveal it on air sometime. Whoa. I am relatively certain I never ever went into this story. Wait a minute, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Not even with me? No, no, not on the phone or anything. No way. <laughs> yeah, 25 years. 25 years, once a week, a at least an not... hour. How many hours is that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fairly certain this has never come up. Wow. But So here's a story from my, I'm thinking 1986, maybe 1987. Okay. But in my house as a kid, there was an electronic typewriter. And this was 1986, mm -hmm. so this was before we had any kind of computer in the house. We had a typewriter. Mm -hmm. And I was intrigued and interested in the fact that I could type something up and it would look really nice and official. <laughs> you know, this was pre-desktop printing, pre-desktop PC at home. Yeah, there was like a crazy method. You had to like do math in order to like center text on a typewriter in those days. I don't know if you remember how to do it. I don't remember how to do it. But there was like something where you had to count how many characters were in the, the sentence. And then like... Oh, God. Yeah, it was bananas. But yes, it, it was it was uh, a lot of like... Uh, it, it There was a lot of work involved in making something look really official. I mean, granted, <laughs> it was still much easier than writing longhand, right? On a sheet mm -hmm. of paper. But continue. So I got it into my head that... It would make a nice official document if I were to do a summary of the Transformers comic in typed up form. <laughs> and clearly I chose the comic book because I had these examples right in front of me. Right. And I didn't have all the episodes on tape. Right. So the comic book I could at least refer to and get the gist of. So it was my idea to start typing up a summary and basically I would like read issue one and then summarize it in typed form, basically not even with any planning or writing it down first. Just, just let me directly type onto this blank paper. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing this and I'm getting to around issue 11, which was the debut of Jetfire in the comic. Mm -hmm. They called him Jetfire instead right. of Skyfire. And... At some point in my synopses, I think it was soon after issue 11, I, <laughs> and again, I was raised on Marvel Comics, so I was a story problem solver. If something didn't make sense, I was going to solve that mystery <laughs> because I was raised on the pursuit of Marvel no prizes. Yeah. And if you don't know what that means, basically that was a situation where if you found a quote-unquote mistake in a Marvel comic, you would write into the editor and explain why it wasn't a mistake. Like, hey, how come Snake Eyes was with this group over here, and then they flashed to the other group, and he's also over there with that group. And then, you know, someone would come up with a realistic explanation of why that could possibly be, and then you would win a quote-unquote no prize which I think was an actual blank envelope that Marvel would send you because <laughs> you would get no prize. See, not having grown up with Marvel Comics, I mean, I read the Transformers comics, but I didn't you know, read a lot of Marvel Comics. So I didn't know about this until well into high school. And I remember it was like, it was a mystery. I was like, what is a no prize? What do they send you? And none of my friends could tell me. And, but they, they always say in the letter column, you know, it's like, it's like your no prize is on its way. I'm like, well, what is it? <laughs> But so I, I didn't have this training that you got from a mm. lifetime of reading this stuff. But yeah, so was that your aim was to look for the, the continuity holes? No, uh, no, no. I, I just wanted a nice little synopsis of the comic. <laughs> but as you're about to learn, it's going to go astray real quick. Uh -oh. Because after I was typing up my synopsis of the Jetfire issue number 11, I decided, well... He's Skyfire on the cartoon, but he's Jetfire in the comic. So I'm going to solve this mystery. Mm. So my nice little third-person synopsis that is going on for 11 issues worth of material, probably I'm probably like three pages in at this point, suddenly it turns into a story <laughs> that I'm just telling into the typewriter, essentially, where Jetfire was sad because he was the only Autobot who could fly and he was depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I'm <laughs> typing this all out in story form, and Optimus is like, Jetfire, why are you sad? And he's like, well, I don't know, I just am. And then they figure out that he's sad because he's the only one that can fly. Mm-hmm. So the rest of the Autobots decide to build him a friend, <laughs> and then they build Skyfire. <laughs> Oh, so he looks just like Jetfire, but now he has a friend that looks like him. Yeah, they both can fly, and then he's happy. <laughs> and so my nice little third-person narrative suddenly shifts over to a novel all of a sudden, and it's all about making Jetfire happy and finding him a friend. And then, if memory serves, I was like, "What did I just do?" and made me angry that my nice little narrative turned into some sort of like weird little <laughs> mini novel and i think i just abandoned the project altogether oh found something else to type see this could have been like a julie and julia kind of thing where like suddenly <laughs> you're like you're writing these long essays about like that start out just as a transformer synopsis but turn into these long blog posts that get collected as a book and then you know flint dilly <laughs> it, and you like you actually get to go and <laughs> You, well, you don't get to meet Flint Dilly, but like you get to be somehow more connected to him <laughs> through this work that you do, this fictional work, and like your friends and your life partner are all worried about you because you're getting, <laughs> you're obsessed about this. But the world needs to know. And then like the moment like the blog comes out, like you get like a thousand publishers calling you on the phone. <laughs> yeah. So IDW, if you want to turn this story where Jetfire is sad. is sad because he's the only Autobot who can fly, and then the Autobots build him Skyfire so he can just, have a friend. I hear a Jim Gaffigan voice of that, like, I wish I had a buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Skyfire, because it is your birthday, we had Wheel Jack and Ratchet put together this guy. <laughs> I mean, it was literally that dumb. <laughs> and granted, well, well, I was only you, I was only about ten, right? But, I was gonna say, but still, like, yeah, the comic that I wrote when I was ten, which I still have, that Silver in the Periodic Forces one, it's like the, the like the story starts with him just being depressed and walking around, and he's like, "What's wrong?" He's like, "Nothing." And then he goes and writes in his diary, <laughs> and then he gets to a fight with a evil guy called Jailbreaker because no prison can hold him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah like not i don't think like 10 year old kids for the most part have a lot of subtlety in the way they explore emotion (laughs) in their stories it's a little bit more raw he's sad why because he's lonely make a friend hey i'm not so sad anymore (laughs) (laughs) the end which i mean not to cross the fandoms again but that was basically uh the emotional arc of mutton junkyard in the gi joe christmas episode (laughs) (laughs) hey we did beat up some cobras now i don't feel so sad anymore (laughs) okay so wow it's surprising that i never heard that story but it's not surprising what the story was (laughs) (laughs) it's like it's like just finding out like a lost episode like yep that fits in. It fits in with everything that I saw. I'm, I'm surprised it didn't get included. <laughs> Speaking of like you potentially like blogging this and becoming a celebrated author, <laughs> I imagine one of the things about this this podcast so far that we've been leaning on is like other Transformer sites for, like to give us like some information about who wrote these episodes, what the log lines are. Uh, I wonder if you could go through some of the the sources and other Transformer sites that you've really enjoyed. So, like for people who are like, if they discovered this podcast, I'm like, hey, I'm reconnecting with this Transformer stuff. Where are some other places they can go? Mm. Well, first and foremost, the Transformers Wiki, which is tfwiki.net. Mm. That's an awesome, super comprehensive site that basically, I won't say they have everything you could want to know, but they certainly have at least every topic you could want to know about gets its own sentence or more. Definitely it's a fantastic start, and it's been interesting to watch it grow over the years. Mm. Just so much information there. And, like, if if you ever have a Transformers question, that's definitely a good place to go first. Mm. And then a couple sites I really love that have cropped up on YouTube is Chris McFeely's The Basics channel. And he will do something like, this episode is going to be The Basics on Soundwave. And he'll tell you, here's how Soundwave was portrayed in the show. Here's how Soundwave was portrayed in the comics. Here's how Soundwave was portrayed in 
different series that came up later, like Transformers Animated and, mm-hmm. you know, Transformers Cybertron, things like that. So if you ever think you have an interest in a certain character, check the Chris McFeely's YouTube site and see if he has a video on the character, because a lot of cool information has come out from those videos. He recently, and by recently, I mean like a year or so ago, showed a lot of the initial character designs Uh, for the animated series from 84 and it sort of explains why prowl and blue streak don't look identical as technically they should because it was the same mold Mm -hmm. but you know it's come out that the animation model was using different iterations of the drawings of the characters Mm. so just all these little details that sort of float up to the surface all these years later are really cool to find out and Chris McFeely's The Basics, as well as Rodimus Primal, is a YouTube personality who has a great channel who goes into a lot of the news aspects, but he also tackles questions like, why didn't Megatron just kill Starscream? You know, things like that that have sort of bothered the fandoms over the years. (laughs) Yeah. And those are always entertaining to watch. Transformers World, which is tfw2005.com. That's a great news site if you just want to be kept up on latest releases and stuff, as well as I think it's the allspark.com. Those are two sites that are just really informative. And there's one great site on Facebook, Talus76 Photography, T-A-L-L-U-S 76 Photography. And what he does is he takes these really wonderful photographs of the toys, usually masterpiece toys, (laughs) but toys that are very spot on to their animation models and he places them in the scenes of the animation basically recreates the animation oftentimes using backdrops from the show yeah and just basically posing the toys in those same positions and just really like recreates the animation with these toys and it's a wonderful time to be a transformers fan because lord knows when we were growing up with these toys oftentimes the toy we had in our hand did not really look a whole lot like the toy we were looking at on the show Mm -hmm. but now with the number of masterpiece transformers you can get it's amazing how closely they can resemble those animation models there's like that new masterpiece prime optimus prime that came out recently and mm-hmm. i mean it first of all it's like i got a whole chip on my shoulder about transformers being a luxury brand right where it's like oh right. it's 475 dollars for a transformer <laughs> oh okay um <laughs> But when you look at the engineering they did on this, like he basically, you, you, he's almost like a mechanical popple, right? Yeah. <laughs> like here he's in truck mode now. Turn him inside out, and he's Optimus yeah. Prime, and he looks like the cartoon version in both versions. There's like YouTube videos of people transforming these things uh, step by step that you can look up, and mm-hmm. you can just do a search for masterpiece, name your transformer, and then you'll find the videos of them being transformed. It's absurd. Yeah how these toys look just like they walked out of the cartoon practically practically not not a thousand percent but you know like pretty darn close mm-hmm. certainly more than they did when, they, when we were taking them off the blister card in 1984 <laughs> so yeah tell us 76 photography that's another neat thing about this particular period in time like as far as fandoms go is like as technology has made production of pro level stuff so democratized mm-hmm just watching how fans are sort of, uh, I don't want to say fans, uh, enthusiasts who are not hired to create media for these particular intellectual properties, right? So people who are engaging with it from a hobbyist standpoint are contributing back to it by making these really interesting, basically like like you were saying, like a, a photo storyboard of an episode. Yeah. There's an Instagram account that I follow, and this is like, again, it's not Transformers, but it's G.I. Joe, and it's this guy who takes like professional photograph- uh, photographs of the toys, but he like makes like a background of like explosions and everything, and he like recreates mm-hmm. the packaging art from the G.I. Joe uh, mm-hmm. toys. So the guy's account is Mate Mylar. And you can follow him on Instagram, and it's like they'll be like Sergeant Slaughter and the Triple T tank box art, but recreated with just the toys. There's something kind of unique about this particular time in that we, when in the early days of the internet, there would be like sort of Photoshop mashups of things where people would take like existing art and clip it together into like different gifts and stuff. But now it's like a whole new level where it's like toy photography. <laughs> it's like a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> the ten year old in me gets really excited about it. <laughs> 
Well, one thing we really wanted to address now that we've done more than 16 of these things is we're starting to get some feedback from people. Yeah. So what really started out as a project to more or less archive our discussions for our own amusement or necessity to archive things or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to basically make a sort of permanent record of our phone discussions because, you know, we would talk on the phone for 25 years and once the conversation was done, it would just, you know, disappear into the ether. Mm -hmm. But now we have basically, we're on the record for these things. So I just wanted to get these in a permanent location mm -hmm. that we could refer to if we ever wanted to listen to ourselves talk. <laughs> <laughs> Which we do. I mean, like, well, we'll talk about the, more of this in a minute, but you edit the show, so you have to listen to the show very carefully. Oh, I certainly do. And, and by the way, these episodes that run about an hour and a half take me at least four hours to edit, probably more like six. That sounds right. So, that, yeah, that's, let me tell you, I wasn't a fan of my voice before. Yeah. And I'm certainly not a fan now. Oh, you're not used to it yet? <laughs> I'm used to it. I just don't like it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's tough to hear your own voice. I feel like I'm largely blind to it now after so many years of doing this stuff. But yeah, but I go back and listen to every episode at least one time before it goes on the air. You're always kind enough to get it done way ahead of time so I can hear it. So I listen to it as well. And it's the only podcast that I do where I actually go back and listen to how it turned out. Just Well, partially because I like to listen to how you edit it all together and get on all the sound clips mm -hmm. and everything. But uh, we'll talk about that. But yeah, some people are actually reaching out to us. And what was fun for me is some of my fellow cartoonists from the comics community have reached out because I have a number of cartoonist friends who are also big Transformers fans like me. And one of them is a buddy of mine named Chris Giarusso. Chris Giarusso, who did... The Chris Giarusso? The Chris Giarusso of G-Man fame, Mini Marvels. Mini Marvels. Yeah. He is incredible. He... If I were to say, like, just to plug him as a cartoonist just for a second, he's one of those people who understands kids' perspective. Like, so, mm -hmm. like, whenever we start talking about, like, silly things about the Transformers series, like, I always jump on this thing about, like, that's the way kids play, you know? Like, and I think mm -hmm. it's fun when you can write a story that, uh, that sort of addresses plot the way kids address plot. And Chris is one of those people who really understands that deeply and intuitively. And so if you have a young person in your life and you want to get them like really excited about reading comics, I think Chris Giruso's G-Man comics are like the perfect place to start because it's like lighthearted, fun superhero stuff, but it's it's meaningful. It's got meat to it. It feels like there's real stakes and drama, but it's it's done in a way that like an eight-year-old will be able to wrap their head around and engage with on their own terms. And it's also just really, really funny. They're really, really funny stories. So <clears throat> I've, I've yet to meet a young person who has read his comics and didn't like them. Anyway, but Chris is also, yeah, a big Transformers fan. And we've had some really fun conversations about Transformers over the years. And he sent a nice message saying, I'm listening to the first ep of Four Million Years Later. And Hoover says he is imagining Frank Welker walking in and picking up little trading card pictures of each character saying, I'll take this one. I'll take this one. I'll take this one. And hogging all the great character voices. And I think I think we even said, like, well, when you're Frank Walker, why wouldn't you? Uh, <laughs> and then Chris continues, I saw a G1 voice actors interview where Frank essentially says exactly what Hoover imagined right down to their big pictures <laughs> of the characters spread out on a table. So either Hoover saw the exact same interview I saw and forgot where the imagined scenario came from, or he's got the most shockingly accurate instincts I've ever heard of. <laughs> now, now, Hoover, before you respond... I want to remind you about my advice about meeting your favorite voice actors or cartoon mm -hmm. writers. As you step up, you say, hey, I think that that you did something really brilliant here. I'm guessing you intended to do that. So you're giving them permission to take credit for it without telling you the <laughs> shocking, horrible truth that they, they were just making it up as they went along. So you get to like pay like a kind compliment to somebody. They get to accept it. You both get to be correct in the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, how do you respond to Chris's guess about you? <laughs> Well, my memory is so bad these days that I could have very well have seen said interview and just forgot that it was an actual thing. <laughs> I used to have such a tight memory yeah. as a child. I would remember every aspect of these Transformer characters. I would remember things on their file card. I would say, no, well, clearly he only has a strength of two, so that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, all these little details 
<laughs> and then I got old. <laughs> And all the details just sort of evaporate. So I feel like I've forgotten more about Transformers than many people will ever know in their life. <laughs> that is one of the things I'm trying to be like good humored about as I get older is uh, when, I, when I'm working with children, because I teach comics classes to young people. And when they tell me about some entertainment that's really important to them right now, like Fortnite is like right now at the time of this recording is super important to like, 10 12 year olds yeah. and then uh, you know i'll say it wrong or i'll spell it wrong and they get <laughs> so angry with me <laughs> you know it's like i've insulted their parents you know like I, it's it's something so deep and profound the faux pas that i've made <laughs> i think about like the story i told in an early episode about my grandmother kept me like i'm gonna go get you those men who turn into cars you know and as a kid i was probably like oh grandma <laughs> why are you so dumb <laughs> they're robots come on you know and as kids we're always like oh i'm never gonna be like that when i grow up and then we grow up and we forget everything and panel two it's me leaning over a child's shoulder while they're playing their uh, you know nintendo switch going like hey what you doing with your game boy there <laughs> it's not a game boy <laughs> old man go play in traffic <laughs> you're useless to society <laughs> Ah, so thank you to Chris for taking the time to send them. He said he was enjoying the podcast, so it's cool yeah, to know. That's awesome. Yeah. So we got reviews, too. Yes, we got our first five-star review a little bit ago, and I wanted to read that because it's awesome. This is from a David Cabal, and he writes, Honest to goodness, G1 Transformers discussion. This podcast puts a unique and fun-filled light on the G1 Transformers cartoon that's refreshing for modern ears. These guys add layers of character development I've never seen for both the Autobots and Decepticons. <laughs> Hoover is a great partner to Jersey. They both balance each other out in their topics and opinions. I love their banter, and I love their passion that they put in this podcast. Please check these guys out. Aw, thank you, David. That is a wonderful review. I feel like there's a lot of negativity in pop culture quote-unquote fandom these days mm. and it's something i would actively like to avoid and it's just not fun you know i don't want to be part of a podcast that says oh this show was so dumb it's so written stupidly and doesn't make any sense and you know we are happy to point out the bizarreness of certain things like when they drove to the Arctic Circle <laughs> or they're flying back and forth to Peru in a matter of minutes or, you know, I'll always point that stuff out just because it's funny. Yeah. But I'm not saying that this is a lame cartoon. If I didn't love this cartoon, I sure wouldn't want to do a podcast about it. And to me, there's so many people out there who seem like they don't love something at all. And yet they're spending a lot of time talking about things they don't love. Well, and I just don't understand that. Something that I picked up on when I started teaching middle school and high school students is I started to see this happening over and over again, year to year. And then I was like, oh, that's right is like something happens around like 13, 14 years old where you're getting smart enough to be able to detect patterns and be able to see where this is going. Mm -hmm. And there's something empowering about that, right? But, you know, but also you are in an environment where revealing any of like your sincere true feelings is is tantamount to social suicide, right? Just go into a room full of teenagers and ask them a, a question where in which to give the answer, you have to raise your hand. You won't get anything. They're going to sit there and stare at you with these dead doll shark eyes, <laughs> you know, because it's so perilous to show enthusiasm amongst your peers when you're that age. And so if you show it in a way that's like, oh, that's so lame, it's safe. It's safe because you're not saying like, I love anything. You're, you're pointing out the thing that sucks and you're pointing out the fact that you're smart because you saw where it was going, right? And I feel like that's appropriate to a 15, 14 year old, right? Um, that's something we all go through. I went through it, right? And, but I try to be very careful when I'm talking about things that I love and, and noticing patterns and things is that like, I, I'm always questioning myself, am I patting myself on the back for detecting a pattern? Am I congratulating myself for being oh so clever because I've mm -hmm. pieced together how this works, right? 
and if there's any of that sense of self congratulation in there, I try to like walk away from it. Like I don't try to push it down or bury it. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. I feel a feeling. I'm feeling very clever right now. I'm gonna step to the side <laughs> because like there's nothing like n- nobody's gonna come up and give me a ticker tape parade because <laughs> because I've put together a sort of an assessment of this pop culture thing from our childhood, right? There's very little at stake. And I think also that like sense of like sneering at something makes, I think, I suspect that it's coming from a sense of, oh, there's something at stake here. I have to be, I have to prove that I'm somehow engaging with it in a way where I win, right? Mm. And, you know, so I, I think there's something inherently vulnerable about saying, no, no, I just love it. And yeah, it is dumb. And some things that I love are really, really silly. Just like we have people in our lives who like do really dumb or silly things, but we still love them. Because actually the secret is, in my opinion, what's lovable about a person is their faults, right? Perfection is not lovable. Uh Uh-oh. What? I'm starting to figure out why we're friends. (laughs) And look, there's nothing more flawed than this guy right over here. Look at him. Oh my (laughs) gosh. Talk about a diamond in the rough. It's like... (laughs) I get tired of that as well. I mean, it gets it gets really tiresome to like be in a room filled with people who just want to go like, oh, everything's lame, and let's sneer at it from a distance because that way we can't get any of its yuck on us. But it is what it is. For my own part, like what, what I tried to come to the show with is like that level of attention to what I'm talking about is like, am I getting really proud of myself about how clever I am? Okay, take a breath. <laughs> Let's get back to talking yeah. why, why Bumblebee is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's definitely episodes we've done in the past where I was like, okay, maybe we're focusing too much on the weirdness or that it took them this long to get to the Arctic Circle or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I just don't want to come across as yet another person bashing these things. Because I honestly love this show, and I always have, and I'm in my 40s now, and if I haven't stopped loving it yet, I don't think it's going to happen. Well, I'd push back on that only to the extent that, not to to question your love of the show, because that is, like, if there's there's one person in this room who knows how much you love the show, I'm standing here. (laughs) But I would would argue that even the, the people who do, like, engage with it in a very, like, sort of sneering way, I think they love it. I think that they, they just express it in a way that is not, I'm going to do another anecdote. I'm totally Bob Newharding this episode. When I was, I was like six years old and my aunt and uncle came to visit us and they were like, sort of like doing that performative marital bickering. They were newly married and they were doing sort of like the, the TV sitcom sort of Ralph Cramden and <laughs> Alice kind of arguing with each other. <laughs> And like in retrospect, I know that's what they were doing. But as a six year old, all I knew was they are so mad. And like I, I sat in my uncle's lap and I was like, hey, look, Uncle Leon, like, do you even like her? <laughs> like, do you guys like each other? Because like, it seems like you really don't like each other. And they both laughed, which totally confused me as a child. Right. <laughs> And so I think like it's it's like part of what we're responding to is that too is like it's like gosh when you just hear nothing but like that sucks that sucks that sucks like well do you even like it yeah I think they do I think that they just are engaging with it in a way like the same way that a teenager is like oh I'm beginning to detect the patterns and I'm I'm I feel very smart about it but I can't say that isn't it cool that there are these patterns I have to go oh isn't it lame that there's those patterns because otherwise that cool person over there with the black lipstick. And the, uh, the 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 piercing in their cheek and the the, the really awesome glasses and the black jacket is not gonna like me, you know. <laughs> I'm not saying that's always the case, but I'm just saying like I think that it shares, in my opinion, shares some DNA with that period in, of your life. Like if you can go back and reconnect with that time in your life, I think you'll find some sympathy <laughs> with the, <laughs> for the people who are like, oh, everything's lame. Well, yeah, yeah, and that's the TCBY kid we've talked about the show, so. Like, uh, you know, everywhere you go, there's some kid working behind the counter, and he's like, oh, everything's lame. Ugh. So I went to buy a, an ice cream cone at this place. It's like cool ice cream, you know? And there's, uh, you know, all these flavors on the board, and, and I'm looking at them, and, you know, and you're really serious when you're checking out your flavors and going, hmm, now what? I don't like raisins, and, you know. And so there's this flavor called Chips Ahoy. And I'm thinking, that could be a lot of things, Chips Ahoy. Maybe there's a lot of chips in it. So I go up to the kid, this little snotty kid with the nose earring, and he's like, Ugh. and I went over and I said, uh, excuse me, what is what is Chips Ahoy? And uh, I swear to God, he goes, guess. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. that. 
what is it? And he says, have you ever heard of Chips Ahoy cookies? Have you ever heard of them? And I was like, well, yeah. And he says, well, they're in vanilla ice cream. Duh. And I just, I started crying. But we got another message. Yes. We got a email, our very first email to be received at 4millionyearslater.com that wasn't just a notification that, hey, you set this up correctly and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but our first real human email was from a Boracua convoy. He says, hey, Jersey and Hoover, just wanted to write in and say how much I'm enjoying the show. First heard about it on an episode of the Retro Cabal podcast. Oh, there's David Cabal again. Yep, there he is. So here's one fan bringing in another fan. So that's what I like. That's awesome. So he says he first heard about it on one episode of the Retro Cabal podcast and decided to give it a listen. I started off with the TPD entries and quickly made my way through to the show proper. And the TPD entries were the little, you know, 5 to 10 to, I think, up to 20 minute little missives you had about various characters throughout the Transformers mythos mm -hmm. and just your little takes on them. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole 30 episodes of those if you haven't listened to those yet. Yeah. But anyway, back to the email we got here. I'm still only on episode two, but listening to you to talk about your love for the G1 cartoon is such a breath of fresh air. A lot of times online, you see fans gripe and complain, but listening to the two of you talk about a cartoon that you clearly love while still being able to poke fun at the silliness has brought much joy to my morning and evening commute. Aww. Keep up the great work. Miguel, Logos Minor, Boracua Convoy. Thank you, Miguel. That's awesome. Because that's, that's another thing, that's another level to this thing that like we didn't talk about with the last piece was talking about it in a way that feels like, well, we're really focusing on the love of the thing. And mm -hmm. I think something we discussed even before doing the show was like, we're going to lovingly rip on it. Right. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to pull apart the weird parts. But we're going to do it in a way that really, you know, there's going to be no question that we absolutely adore this cartoon. We'll dissect it. We'll take it all yeah. apart. We'll call something weird something weird. Yeah. But we do it out of love and we'll say, isn't this something weird great? Yeah. 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 Because like the, 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 a lot of times something weird can lead us down some odd theorizing about this show. <laughs> but also like the thing that I didn't say is that like sometimes it can feel like does the world even want that, right? Mm. Just go to twitter.com sometimes. Go to that website and spend any time there. And it's like a lot of people are expressing their pain in a variety of ways mm -hmm. in, 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 in to varying degrees with varying levels of like severity. And so one could surmise that like, oh gosh, well, it seems like discourse in the 21st century is largely about expressing urgent, immediate pain. And... <laughs> Is anybody asking for somebody to show up and go like, you know what I really like? <laughs> <laughs> so just to get that feedback, like I'm just trying to say like so what Miguel's message and what David's message and, you know, Chris Chirisa's message is like, it, it's meaningful to hear that because it's basically saying like, oh, okay, there are people who are actually like looking for loving discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop and say, like, there are plenty of legitimate reasons to express pain in the way that you engage messaging and media. And there's a lot of, like, real awful stuff in this world. And I'm not trying to diminish anybody's experiences or say that there's no reason to, to express yourself that way. There's tons of reason to. It's just that for our purposes, for this particular thing, we really wanted to walk into it with a, a, the spirit of celebration. So mm -hmm. there is plenty of pain and suffering in the world. It exists. Yeah. It's just, I'd rather focus on positivity. At least with this. There's other, pl other places for us to, t to take our pain. <laughs> you also got some other feedback from another podcaster. Uh-huh. Well, Rick Heineken of the podcast Jeff and Rick Present, Unpacking the Power of Power Pack, mm. which is a podcast all about the 1980s comic book Power Pack from Marvel Comics. He and I had struck up conversation because we're both fans of each other's work now. And he gave us some praise and told me, quote, seriously, you do some great editing work. And that made me feel good because he edits his podcast. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to commiserate about how much work that is just to have what ends up being a hour and a half show and spend literally about six hours crafting it into what it is and editing out all my uhs and <laughs> all that sort of thing you do let me let me stop and say you do a fabulous job editing the show and i i have done my share of editing podcasts i know how much work it is and you really like 
Mm-hmm. I often see like comics is a, a an art form that really asks a lot of you. Like it, it's so funny because it's like, oh, you need a pencil and paper and you can make a comic, which is true. But like if you really care about the craft, it's going to ask a lot of you. And I feel like if you really care, like it shows that. Let me say it this way it really shows that you care about how this thing is being met by the world in the way, the mm. level of, of attention you put into the editing. Because the shows always come out, I would say, 80% tighter than, than the initial recording. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> See, one thing about me that most people wouldn't know is that I work at a job where I can have headphones on the entirety of the day. Yeah. If anyone's talking at me, they're usually talking at me via some sort of Skype instant message. Mm. So I don't have to hear anything anyone says. Mm. <laughs> so I listen to eight and a half hours of podcasts per day, Holy five cow. days a week. So this has given me a crash course on what is good to have in a podcast and what is not good to have in a podcast. Yeah. So I was able to take that knowledge and put it into this show, which is not to say that this is a perfect podcast. I'm not bending over, patting myself on the back or anything like that. But I know some things to avoid. I know some things to do if you can do it. And I've learned a lot with, I mean, I would hate to do the math on that because I've been in this job for over three years now. And so three years, five days a week, almost every week. Eight and a half hours a day. I don't want to even start that math. So, <laughs> so I've learned a lot, and thankfully, it's showing to people who also edit podcasts. So that that makes me feel good. Yeah, yeah. No, that's part of you know when you start interacting with a craft. Like part of the sort of life cycle of the thing is hearing from your peers how it's doing, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. It's a feedback loop. Yeah, and that's that's a necessary part of leveling up as well. So. And Jersey talks so fast and is trying to express seven ideas at once sometimes <laughs> that I have to play the sentence back and say, well, here's where he started to go down a road, but then he course corrected. So let me just shave off that first part. Is that why and- I sound so good on the show? <laughs> you're going to listen to the, all these shows and then you're going to meet Jersey in real life and you're going to be like, uh. Yeah, I do do that. There's a disconnect. <laughs> I definitely do that. And my wife will sympathize with you because she said that when I get into that mode, it, like it's like I'm sucking the air out of the room is the language <laughs> she's because I start I get faster and faster and like I'm like sort of yeah, building a point from six different directions and I go back and forth to all of them. <laughs> Which is wonderful because it shows his love of a thing. <laughs> but it's not wonderful for editing is all I'm saying. Oh my gosh. I didn't even realize that you were trimming up my sentences. Cause like when I listen to him again, <laughs> I'm like, I can't always do it. Sometimes it's just, <laughs> you know, I can't break it apart because <laughs> you've always wanted to be John Mashita. And but. I literally did. I did practice in, in middle school talking faster, faster. And I, and I, in my head, I was thinking like, everybody's going to think I'm cool. <laughs> Like, honestly, for true, I'd look in the mirror and I'd talk really fast. I'd be like, yeah, I wait till school on Monday. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh. I'm not suggesting you should be any other way. <laughs> I'm not saying it would be better if you were any other way. I'm just saying it would be easier to edit. <laughs> but but I'm not asking you to change. Don't worry. Oh, no, I, I'm just... I'm surprised and delighted to real to hear that you're putting that much level of work into this thing because this is the first I've heard of this. This is literally the first time I've heard you say this. But yeah, like it's I, I have a feeling the next time you see my wife, you guys could have some serious commiseration together. <laughs> I know it's hard. I mean, I'm not saying this like, oh, I'm being married is like the worst thing in the entire world. And I hate marriage. I really have zero patience for that attitude. But but I know that like spending your life and and spending time working on a thing with a person, like it brings you to a whole new level of endurance, right? <laughs> and I know that I'm not the easiest person to work with sometimes because of things like that. So, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I've just listened to like far too many completely unedited podcasts where they just hit record and then they talk until they're done and then they hit stop and then they just throw it out into the world. And I wanted something a little cleaner, something that was more clear for the listener. I don't want us to go, uh, for three minutes while the listener is going, it's Springer. His name is Springer. 
I do know that there's at least one instance where you told me I said the wrong Transformers name. You had to go back and find another instance where I said the correct Transformers name and like <laughs> transpose it in. And and when I went back and listened, I was like, oh, it sounds like I said it right. Like he, he edited yeah. it so cleanly that like it doesn't sound like, oh, and then Springer went into the room. <laughs> there have been moments that were kind of close to that. And I had to weigh whether they were worth leaving in like that or just abandon because... <laughs> I love the uh, undo command. Yeah. I use Audacity to edit these things, mm-hmm. which is a wonderful free program. But like I'll always try to edit a unclear, long, rambly type of sentence. But if I can't do it to where it sounds natural, sometimes I'll just have to leave it in. Uh. And, you know, I'm sure it just goes right over people's heads. You know, they're not scrutinizing every sentence like I am. So No, they're not living with it as long as you are, right? Right. So it, it's just glad to hear editing praise from someone who has to do this very same thing well and in some of the later episodes in season one as well you like we're just like continually upping your game about like the way you worked in the sound clips for things like when we would do the gags with commercial breaks and like the sometimes like our our dialogue would be broken by the audio clip where it's like, here's like a clip from Happy Meal commercial. But other times, like, you'll weave it in and out of what we're saying. So it'll still be playing in the background, but it'll like pop up again in between when we take like natural pauses in the, in the, in the speaking. So I'm so smart. I'm so smart. I'm so smart. I'm so smart. Yeah, it's just fun to do little things like that because if I'm not having fun doing this, I'm not going to want to do it so yeah i just try to make it fun hopefully <laughs> hopefully it's fun for the listener <laughs> but primarily i make it fun for me <laughs> uh so we also got uh, messages on our facebook page that's another thing that we have a facebook page for four million mm-hmm. years later any of you old people like us are on facebook feel free to look up four million years later a transformers podcast we're on there and we got a message from a guy jessup braithwaite who says hi guys discovered your podcast today great stuff keep it coming thank you greetings from the uk so we're getting fans across the pond oh my gosh it's almost like this internet thing's all over the world yeah (laughs) I guess it really is a worldwide web. <laughs> worldwide, that's right. www. https <laughs> colon backslash backslash. <laughs> yeah, and he didn't even say anything about how in your country, comic books are this way, but in our country, comic books were more like magazines. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of the UK Transformers comics growing up, so it's nice to think about the fact that we have someone listening all the way over there. Because we are in Texas, me, and Ohio for Jersey. Yeah. So we are in the U.S. and are basically talking about all this stuff from a growing up in the U.S. perspective. So, But speaking of Facebook, we got a review. So you can review groups on Facebook or pages? Yeah. Yeah. You can leave a little review for it. Oh. So, and we got one of those. Neat. Why don't you read this one? Okay. I'll read this one. So we got a review from Ashley Knapp, Uh, actually somebody I've known for a long time now. Ashley has been interacting with other podcast stuff that I do, and Ashley says, uh, for the review, it reads, a wholesome, perfect way to start or end the day. What is part of a complete mm-hmm. breakfast? Holy cow! Like that. Ashley didn't say that. I added that. <laughs> but given that we're, we've talked about that in the past too, is like, what's a complete breakfast? Well, it's orange juice and a bowl of cereal and maybe some toast. <laughs> so, like now, including the four million years later podcast. <laughs> and Ashley continues. I already love Transformers, but this podcast helps me appreciate it even more. Hoover and Jersey, the hosts, have such a long history that listening to them banter is comforting, like sitting with old friends. That's awesome. Thank you, Ashley. That's great. Has anyone seen that meme where it says what it feels like to listen to podcasts? And it's this person sitting on the floor eating like a bowl of cereal. He and he's next to a poster of people eating. (laughs) No. I would see so this. it really makes you feel like you're involved with these people. And yeah. if, if you guys actually can tolerate us for over 16 episodes now, you know, more power to you. We're glad to have you. So I've been doing podcasting for, oh my gosh, like 13 years now. And I remember it was about two or three years in when I had my first instance where somebody started talking to me like they've always known me. 
And it, it was a little off putting at first. I'm like, wait, who are you? Mm. You know, because I was like trying to catch up. I'm like, okay, I clearly met this person and forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm being a real jerk right now for not remembering who they are. And then it was like, you know, I, I asked, like, okay, where did we meet before? He's like, oh, no, we've never met. I just listened to your podcast. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's happened a few times since then. I actually had a person literally recognize me from like on the street, not by my face, but by my laugh. They heard me laughing. <laughs> And honestly, for true, he turns around, he's like, that, that sounds like Jersey Droz. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was, I was drawing on a wall with children. <laughs> so he like also caught me at like, you know, like my natural state. <laughs> Here's the Jersey in his natural habitat. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I was laughing because the kids were trying really funny stuff. But, but, uh, but yeah, like, so it's only happened a handful of times, but like, it's certainly never like visually, like they see me across from like, oh, that's him. It's him. But like mm -hmm. instances where like I've been at an event and somebody comes up. So that, that is one of the weird things that I've, I've sort of I wouldn't say I've gotten used to, but I've learned I've come to expect in meeting people for the first time is that they may have heard my voice hours and hours <laughs> of my voice. <laughs> I mean, it's neat. It's a it's a neat little bit of cognitive dissonance of somebody knowing mm. so much about you and you know nothing mm. about them. Like it's it's this delightful disadvantage to be at, you know? Yeah. You took everything from me. I don't even know who you are. You will. And then the the cool part is that like I have an opportunity to like make it all about somebody else and learn as much as I can about them. So like even the scales. So, <laughs> but uh, speaking of hearing voices, <laughs> we do like one of the neat things about this this anchor app where the podcast is being created and distributed is you can actually send us audio messages. Mm -hmm. And we got another podcast that I do. But podcast, podcast, podcast. I'm gonna say that word until I'm blue in the in the podcast. <laughs> is I make a show called the Lean Into Art Cast. And this show is it's me and a designer friend of mine named Rob Stenzinger. He's a designer. He, he's a UI UX designer. He's a game designer, and he is a coach. Like like not like a baseball coach, but like a creative project coach. So if you're having difficulty with navigating some kind of creative endeavor, he like you could sign up to take like sessions with him where he like basically does like sort of like guided discussion to help you evaluate what all your options are. But yeah, he's also my co-host of the Lena Tart cast, which we've been doing for a long time. And we're at like episode 305 at the time of this recording. <laughs> so talk about hours. But yeah, he sent us a, a, a thoughtful response. He's been listening to the show and he's been giving me a lot of feedback on it. And then he finally uh, decided to send in something to play on the show. So here it is. Hey, Jersey and Hoover. This is Rob Stenzinger calling in, and I want to say congratulations on your first season of Four Million Years Later. It's a lot of fun hearing how you two navigate all these different plot and characters and, and the choices and the storytelling in, in scene by scene, every single episode of the show, Transformers. And it's um, I'm, I'm like a casual fan of the show and, and the characters and stuff, and I love robots. But what I super love is how you are analyzing it and exploring it. And, and like you're joking around and having fun, but it's, it's not like it's, um, it, it's with so much fun and joy and forgiveness. You know, it's like sighs and laughs and all that stuff. And I am really appreciating that as someone who enjoys learning about storytelling. And one thing that's always a curiosity every episode is how is Hoover going to introduce himself next? And that keeps me extra on the edge of my seat. So thanks for doing the show. So that is a good question that Rob raises in terms of week to week, your name changes. <laughs> I mean, in the ultimate doom episodes, it's not like there was like a, a lot of mental gymnastics to go through to get to that. <laughs> but like, I am curious about what you're going to do about some other later episodes, like the search for alpha Tryon, the, the girl who loved power glide, <laughs> the master builders. Yeah. I guess we'll just have to see. We'll see if I actually decide to do something creative or I just stick with the old, dumb, original <laughs> idea. Can we come up with some kind of like portmanteau of things like taking Lord Geikany and mix, mix it with something else <laughs> with Hoover? But yeah, I mean, like he's also pointing to the fact that like we always introduce ourselves on the show. I say, I'm Jersey Drills, I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist. The other host is and you know, like, just Hoover or the ultimate Hoove or fire in the Hoove or... Well, it's because you have an actual job title and you are actual fully functioning human being with a 
function just like Transformers and I'm just a guy who goes to work and makes a podcast and goes to sleep and reads some comic books and goes back to sleep and well but yeah uh, yeah I mean I don't I don't want to turn this into like like a, like a self help session but <laughs> but no but can you fix me <laughs> I have a line of work that is it's in the entertainment field, right? And it's entertainment and advocacy. So like it's very public facing work that I do. And it also directly relates to like the analysis that I'm going to bring to this thing. However, that said, I do think that you now have a sort of a side hustle that is public facing <laughs> in that you are a podcaster now, right? Yeah, I guess I am officially a podcaster. Yeah. So and that is that's as public facing as it gets. <laughs> it's 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 syndicated you know through through uh rss so so the, they're even listening in the uk you, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know why don't we just like make like an autobot and just drive there and go say hi <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to rob for that message old friend of mine and it, it's also nice to hear from other people who like think really hard about creativity like ha hearing them thoughtfully engage with this little fun project that we make so and thanks to rob we finally gave hoover a job title <laughs> my previous one was just big loser primary function podcaster secondary function <laughs> big loser <laughs> Let's break out that red piece of cellophane and see what his stats are. Courage to... Oh. Hey, how come it's just a flat line? Everything is two? <laughs> Wait a minute. There's continuity detection. 11? <laughs> they don't even go to 11. Eating 12? <laughs> just keep going higher and higher. Oh, man. All right. Well, is there any other thoughts or reflections that we had about like wrapping up season one? Hmm. In a way, it seems like more than it is because it was only 16 episodes. I know it's going to seem like we're in season two for about 47 years. Yeah. Even doing one episode a week, that's... It's going to be the better part of a year of work to get that oh done. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, in other words, I quit now. <laughs> so, it just sounds too daunting. <laughs> Like the moment he sees the math, he pulls the eject cord. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> no, I, I guess we'll keep doing this. I, it's not like I have a, an extremely elaborate social life to get back to. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens as the show grows. And then all of a sudden all these speaking engagements start happening. <laughs> Because everybody's going to want us to come talk uh, at like colleges about the importance of <laughs> the Transformers series. I could see somebody doing that. Not me, but <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I guess like that's that's a good way to close this one. What are you, Hoover, the ultimate Hoove, heavy metal Hoove? What is he looking forward to in season two? Are there any episodes that you're like, ah, oh, I am looking forward to like diving back into this one and discovering something new with it or like or there is there any particular aspects of the next season that you're really looking forward to digging in deeply on there for sure is because i've definitely seen all the episodes before but there's a good handful of episodes i haven't seen in probably 10 years or so yeah like that i've just skipped over or i've just had on in the background and not really paid any attention to like i want to revisit things like hoist goes hollywood and see is it truly a terrible episode is it actually funner than i remember you know it's like i don't have a good memory of it other than some of the little crazy details like everyone wearing alien masks and and that director who keeps calling him moist Yes. Yeah. So just episodes like that that I don't have a really... That basically the ones that I didn't run into the ground watching over and over mm -hmm. again. Like, I, I can't tell you how many times I watched Fire in the Sky yeah. in my life, but, like, something like... Autobop. Yeah. Something like Bot. Yeah. B-O-T or whatever it's called. Like, something like that I've probably only seen, like, I don't know, make, maybe five times in my life. <laughs> I love that that's like a low number for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, yeah, I might have fully watched like, you know, Autobot and Spike like six times. <laughs> right.
This is some of these lesser seen episodes for me. I'm interested in getting into and seeing what I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm really looking forward to reconnecting with this season in a more thoughtful and an intentional way because I think I'm very similar to you in that Transformers the movie and the first season got so much play in my life. Like mm-hmm. I can recite entire episodes from season one, but and and like I think Transformers the movie. Mm-hmm. But there are episodes that are just kind of like big blank spots where I have a general feeling about what happened in that one, like Atlantis Arise, Day of the Machines. Yeah. I can give you like a sense of what happened, but I don't remember specifically. Or Creme Zeke, right? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot to look forward to there of us sort of. I, I think that's going to be a lot of the character of these episodes. It's like, wow, I am surprised at how I engage with this as an adult versus how I think I engaged with it as a child. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it'll be fun to see if there's any like hidden gems that we didn't really pay much attention to for whatever reason before, but we really come to appreciate. Yeah. And it will be in the spirit of celebration, as it always is. So, all right. Deep cleansing breath. <laughs> <laughs> and let's dive in and do it again. Thanks, Oof. Thank you, Jersey. And thank you, everyone, for listening. It seriously means a lot. Because, as I said, this podcast is intended as a record of our conversations, but it's really nice to have other people listen in and find things to actually praise about us. Yeah. That's that's nice. I, I don't hear enough praise of me <laughs> in reality. So it's nice to actually hear strangers say nice things about us. That's always a plus. Always. So if you'd like to contact us, You know, there's going to be numerous ways to do that, and it will all be in the little outro, so just take a listen there. Write us an email, send us a message, write us a review if you enjoy this episode and all our other episodes, you know, give us reviews. We love those things. Actually, if I could say one thing, like, so this is the thing, whenever I give people advice on talking with creative people that they, whose work they enjoy, and this this is a strategy I developed for myself ages ago when I, so like, when I met Peter Cullen, for the first time, I froze and I just barfed out, are you tired of this yet? <laughs> and when he was signing autographs, he was like, no, why would I be? And I'm like, yeah, that's, I, I froze. I'm sorry. It, this was a very meaningful mm-hmm. moment and I dropped the ball. So I met him like 10 years later at another convention and I had a speech ready. Not a speech, but more like a blurb, a sort of a review of him as a person. <laughs> and, and like, and he stood up and he said, like, anybody who'd wait two hours in line to say that to me, it must be a really good person. And like, let me, t- <laughs> let me tell you, you hear Peter Collins say that? For, forget everything else, right? Like, like I don't even remember my wedding as well as I remember that moment, right? I started crying right in front of the man, you know? Like, I ran away. I'm like, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Can't let Optimus see me cry. Why, why, would I, why would I have a problem with that? That's weird. Anyway, but like, so like, I, I try to say to people who are, you know, expressing appreciation, a way to make it extra meaningful is if you can think of, like, between one and three things that they do differently than everybody else. Right. So like when I met Blue Man Kuma, uh, who played Tigatron and Beast Wars, I said, like, hey, look, I just think it's incredible how you can switch from like Zen Master to ferocious Klingon. I'm going to kill you voice in the flip <laughs> of a switch like Tigatron can go from like peaceful, warm, gentle creature to really frightening character really fast. And, like I just I really admire that about your work. And then again, he was like, wow, wow. Nobody's ever said that to me before. And the, the moment meant more between the two of us. And so. Mm. When I'm talking with young people at comic cons and stuff, I'm like, yeah, if you're going to go talk to this particular famous person, try to think of three things they do differently or better than anybody else and just list them. And that, that's all you got to do. And then they're going to feel great. And you're going to feel great because you've connected with this person. So if anybody wants to write us a review, and please, that's, it's a wonderful thing to like donate your time and creativity towards helping the show by way of reviews, is name an episode and maybe name one thing about it that you really liked. Like, what's one thing that we did in a past four million years later episode that like made you say like, ah, that's why I listened to this. What were the funniest exchanges between us? I would love to hear feedback on that. What was Hoover's best Transformers theory that connected some, some (laughs) invisible lines? What was, what was Jersey's most thoughtful ramble? (laughs) 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 Yeah. Just like stuff like that. Like, so, and also that just helps frame up the whole like ambiguity of having to write a review. Cause I know what that's asking somebody to do. You're asking somebody to sit down and like commit ideas to even a silly iTunes thing. Mm -hmm. It's still just effort in that. So try to simplify it 
name one to three things and specific things. Yeah. How, how are we different from, I mean, Lord knows there's a handful of other podcasts out there that are going through the Transformers cartoon episode by episode. You know, if you think we're different and want to point people our way, you know, write a review, yep. you know, explain how we're different. And, you know, that's what I really love about like all these bits of reviews and emails and everything that we've gotten so far is they seem to get us. Yeah. And I really appreciate that, that it's coming across. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be back next week with season two, episode one. What? Which one is it? Autobot Spike. Oh, no. He's a monster. A Frankenstein <laughs> monster. Frankenstein. I'll see Frankenstein one more time because I'm going to say it 20 times in this episode. <laughs> and it's public domain, so it's all legal. <laughs> Oh, I'm looking forward to it. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Until then, I've been Jersey Drozd of 4 million years com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been Hoover, Big Loser, and Podcaster. Both. Scratch that. Reverse it. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4millionyearslater.com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>